Okay, good evening everybody. I am not Chris Henry. <laughs> uh, Chris was, uh, Chris, our, uh, for those of you who don't know, our museum manager who usually uh, runs our speaker series uh, was uh, called away to talk about B-29, so the 128th Air Refueling Wing down in uh, Milwaukee tonight. So, um, you know, I guess when the guard calls up and asks you to give a presentation for them, you, uh, you say yes right away, and uh, you, uh, you, you put your uh, podcast co-host in charge of the, uh, of the uh, speaker series. So. Um, so, yes, my name is Tom Charpentier. I am Government Relations Director here here at EAA, um, handling uh, regulatory policy, safety, medical policy, and a few other things for our government relations side. Um, but I'm also one of the co-hosts of our Green Dot podcast, which you can catch uh, every other week anywhere you get your podcast. Pretty much, uh, you can find it. Uh, so I'll be uh, I'll be filling in as your host tonight. Um, for those of you who are new to this, this is our speaker series, our museum uh, a program that we do just about every month. Air Venture and a few holidays aside, uh, and Chris does a fantastic job uh, scheduling um, guests for this uh, very special guest for this um, uh, for this program. Our uh, our guest tonight is no exception to that. Um, next month will be uh, a a talk from an F eight. Uh, Crusader, excuse me, uh, pilot, um, who, uh, uh, so that should be very interesting. The, uh, the F-8, of course, the iconic, um, kind of the last of the gunfighters of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, Na of the U.S. Navy. Uh, so that'll be, uh, that'll be a pretty interesting presentation. I'll be uh, very excited to see that one as well. And as many of you have noticed, uh, we just opened our newly refurbished gift shop. So definitely uh, make sure to check that out. Uh, I believe it's open right now, but um, anyway, uh, if you want to, uh, uh, for all of your, your aviation shopping needs. And by the way, a very, very amazing model collection. So if you're into plastic models at all, no kidding, we've got a really, really good selection of, uh, of model kits up there um, to, uh, to take a look at. So um, definitely check, check some of that stuff out. So tonight's uh, speaker is Captain John Van Etten. Uh, Captain Van Etten is, uh, among many other things, a, a Vietnam War vet flying 198 combat missions in Southeast Asia, um, in the, uh, in the OV, mostly in the OV-10 Bronco, uh, the, um, the famous uh, close air support and forward air control aircraft. Uh, he, in the course of his career, participated in 15 combat search and rescue missions, uh, and twice in those missions he was awarded the, the Distinguished Flying Cross. And, um, there's one mission in particular that he is famous for um, that he'll get into tonight, but um, he also told us about another rescue during our podcast taping this evening, or, or earlier today, that uh, uh, honestly was almost even a crazier story than the rescue of Bat-2-1, so that we'll, uh, we might get into that uh, as well. He's also a longtime EAA member, going back to the 1970s. I neglected to look up his EAA number uh, before we, uh, we got started here, but I'm sure it's, uh, uh, it's, it's you know, one of the earlier ones. So. Um, um, he's, uh, he's a long-time uh, EA member and current-time GA pilot. Um, he and his wife flew here in their twin Comanche uh, from, uh, from Michigan to be here with us. So um, that was, that's, uh, that's awesome. So uh, for those of you who, um, who, who may know or may not know, uh, the rescue of Bat-2-1 was a uh, mission during the, Viet the later stages of the Vietnam War where an EB-66 was shot down in the midst of a major offensive by the North Vietnamese, and uh, the sole survivor that we know of who survived the ejection, um, uh, Colonel Hamilton, uh, was, um, was a very important intelligence asset, and it became a very, very intense effort to rescue him. And Captain Van Etten was very much in the midst of that and uh, has a, a fantastic story to tell, a uh, very harrowing story to tell uh, from that. So with that, Captain Van Etten, welcome. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Nice group here tonight. Um, I have a question first before I start my, uh, my speech. Um, how many of you have seen the movie Bat 21, the Hollywood one with Gene Hackman and all that? Okay, um, my opinion, that was Hollywood. <laughs> uh, it was way, way wrong uh, in too many ways. 
Uh, but the, uh, the mission, first of all, the mission took 11 days. Um, so it wasn't, wasn't a quick operation. But I'd like to tell you the true story of the rescue of I Seal Jean Hamilton, uh, who was known as, as Bat 21. It took place in the early part of April in 1972, where the North, North Vietnamese had moved 30,000 troops just net north of the Camelot River. And, um, yes, I guess it's working. Okay, uh, just north of the Camelot River. And, uh, <coughs> Jean, gonna, there's Jean. Uh, Jean was a tall 52-year-old lieutenant colonel. Um, he's a navigator and he never should have been on that airplane. Um, he has a photographic memory and he uh, knew everything about our surface to air missiles and the Russian ones. Uh, but he was filled in for somebody that had the flu or something, so he was on the airplane. Um, <coughs> he would have been a fantastic prize for the bad guys because of his intelligence and because of his uh, photographic memory. Gene's uh, <coughs> rescue, um, the mission or the SAR, search and rescue, became the most famous of all the wartime uh, rescue missions in Southeast Asia because of its duration complexity, and the loss of life. Uh, there's a movie, which you know, a lot of you all have seen, and three books written about this rescue, and which I was a participant. Uh, but first, let me give you a little bit of background about myself. Uh, born in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, moved to the family ranch, cattle ranch, when I was a year old. I could ride a horse before I could ride a bicycle. <laughs> uh, and in June 1969, I graduated from Purdue University's Aeronautics School and joined the Air Force uh, a month later. In September of that year, I completed officer training school and was sent to Vance Air Force Base in Enid, Oklahoma for pilot training. I graduated third in the class of 67 uh, and received my silver wings my mother was nice enough to pin them on for me. Uh, <clears throat> after, the, uh, from the available list of aircraft uh, that I could pick, I picked the OV-10. Um, don't ask me why, but, but I did. Um, and my new assignment, because of the OV-10, uh, that guaranteed my new assignment would be as a forward air controller uh, in, in Southeast Asia because the, the war was um, hot and heavy at that time. And uh, my, uh, I, I would be a FAC or a forward air controller, and our job was to fly low and slow and find targets on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, um, you know, and, and contact fighters and have them come in and destroy the trucks and, and the anti-aircraft guns. Um, and that, that was our primary mission. Um, and this is... This is the OV-10 that I flew um, on the trail. <clears throat> My first uh, assignment after pilot training was air to ground gunnery school uh, at Cannon Air Force Base, New Mexico. Uh, we flew uh, antique T-33s um, with uh, their machine guns and rockets and bombs and we went to the gunnery range every day and practiced and practiced and um, of course, the pilots, we all bet 25 cents on strafe and 25 cents on bombs. So it was really, you know, expensive. Um, and uh, the airplane was, was uh, old and it, it was, um, had some really, had no nose, uh, so you had to use brakes to turn the thing. Uh, it had a really slow to accelerate engine uh, and it had 300 gallons on each wingtip in the tanks. So when you flew it, it, it wanted to just do that all day long. So it was not, not my favorite airplane as far as aerodynamics go. Um, and I was, everything was doing great. We were going through the program and, you know, everything was fine. Um, 
And so I sit down at a briefing one day, and uh, we, it, four, four pilots, we had, we're taking four airplanes to the gunnery range, and, uh, and this nurse comes in, and uh, she walks over to me and said, I'm riding in your back seat today. And I said, no, you're not. And she said, yes, I am. She said, I've been working on this for two years to get a ride in one of the empty back seats of the T-33. And she said, the base commander finally signed you know, the papers. And so here I am. And I thought, oh my god. And so I, I sat her down and said, you really don't want to do this. I, I said, it is very uncomfortable to take off and then go to a gunnery range. And I said, well, you're pulling six, seven Gs. You know, you're doing rapid turns. I said, it's just not, you know, <clears throat> it's just not fun. And she would not be, she would not be dissuaded. So, um, you know, we got her a flight suit and a helmet and all that. We put her in the back seat. And uh, we really didn't need the oxygen mask because we didn't go high. But we had to have them on because that was the intercom. That was where the microphone was. So uh, we strapped her all in and I said, look, if you get unhappy and sick or whatever, I said, I can't reach you. I said, she's behind me. Uh, there's no way I can help you. And, um, and, and I said, our missions are graded and you know, if, if you have a problem, I'm just going to ignore you. And she said, oh, I, that's no problem. I, I won't have a problem. <laughs> okay. So I take off. We go to the gunnery range. And I roll in on the first bomb pass. And I pull off. And we're pulling about six Gs. And then you go zero G. And then roll 90 degrees. And five Gs again to go around the pattern. And you have to do that because everybody else is doing that. And you have to stay in position. And uh, I, I asked her, I said, how are you doing back there? And she said, well, I feel a little dizzy. And I thought, oh boy, this isn't good. And then, uh, and then I came in on another bomb pass and pulled off and, you know, I could hear her getting sick back there. And I just, there's nothing I could do, so I just reached down and turned the intercom off. <laughs> <laughs> and flew the rest of the mission. And I, I knew it wasn't going to be pretty when we stopped. Uh, and the crew chief, you know, opened the can. I opened the canopy, and the crew chief puts the ladder on. It comes up and goes, "Oh my God!" <laughs> and and they they had to physically pull her out of the airplane, and uh, you know, took her in and tried to get her cleaned off and all that. And so, in the, when I was debriefing the mission, uh, she comes in and she's still kind of green, and and sits down in the back. And I'm saying, "I'm really sorry. I tried to warn you." She said, you know, I think I threw up the milk duds I ate in fourth grade. <laughs> so after it was all said and done, the end of the three-month tour there, uh, I was very happy to be presented with the Top Gun Trophy for the class. And then, uh, then it was on to uh, Eglin Air Force Base to learn how to fly the OV-10. And it was similar to the gunnery range because we had to take the, we had to get qualified with the guns and bombs and the rockets and all that all over again in a different airplane. Um, and it, it was a a beautiful assignment. Eglin is in the in Florida, in the Panhandle of Florida, and the weather was great. And I mean, it was it was probably one of the best tours that I had. Um, <clears throat> and then after. You know, after the OB-10 school was, was completed, uh, I was fortunate enough, fortunate again to be uh, designated the top gun in the class. Um, <clears throat> and after, from there I went to water survival school, and then global survival school, and then jungle survival school. I mean, it's tough just to survive the survival schools. <laughs> and. And then I was followed with a, that was followed by a flight to Vietnam where I landed in Cameron Bay and uh, we went through a little introduction and they told me my PCS or my permanent station was going to be in Thailand at a base called Nakam Phanam, which is, uh, and we called it NKP. Uh, my first day at the base was, <coughs> was uh, the weather was incredibly hot and humid. 
uh, it, it'd be 85 degrees and pouring rain. Uh, the pr predominant odors of the base were mildew and jet fuel. It was not the best. Uh, the BOQ that I lived in, or bachelor's officer's quarters, um, <clears throat> it, it was um, a single story wooden structure that was elevated four feet above the ground. Um, it, and had eight single rooms in a row. My BOQ room had two beds, a window air conditioner that was on the day I got there and was there that on the day I left in full cold, never changed. Um, it, the environment out over there is absolutely miserable. Uh, I had a small refrigerator, two small desks, chairs. The bathroom facilities were uh, a communal affair. You go out my door, and left three doors down. And there were sinks, but no privacy. And a flashlight was required uh, to go there after dark because of the resident cobras. <clears throat> I all soon discovered that all of the facts at the base had the same call sign, which was nail, uh, followed by a number. And that indicated that they, the nail part indicated that, that they were based at NKP in Thailand. Uh, and the number was the sequence to how you signed in. Uh, so I, I went with my good friend Dave Bressman, and we signed in. He signed in first. So his call sign was nail 31. And I signed in behind him. I was nail 32. And, and so on. And uh, <coughs> <clears throat> and everybody had a, a call sign uh, that th the fax that was started with a nail. But all the pilots that signed in uh, that had a three in front of their was the first number in their call sign. Like mine was 30, nail 32, so I was one with a three. Day had a 32, had a three. Every guy that signed in that month that had a three in front of their name was either killed, shot down, or prisoner of war, except one, nail 32. That's lucky. <clears throat> Years later, the Discovery Channel uh, would label our missions uh, suicide missions because of the number of people we lost. Um, <clears throat> and now I'll tell you how I became involved in search and rescue missions. After six, six months of operation as a FAC, uh, killing trucks and guns on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, um, I was selected to be one of the on-scene commanders for search and rescue missions. Uh, certification would allow me to personally act as the airborne command post, uh, flying above the rescue and coordinating all friendly activity involving that rescue. Um, and rank meant absolutely nothing. Um, <clears throat> I would request and direct fire from Navy battleships on station. Uh, I'd work with the, Navy, with the Army on the ground, on fighters in the air. I mean, for a rescue, uh, I was like a control tower at an airport. You know, I had to set it all up, and it was my responsibility. Um, it was a huge responsibility and dangerous, but the personal rewards for a successful rescue were absolutely wonderful. The OV-10 carried 14 rockets, and normally we use smoke rockets, so when we found a target, we'd shoot a smoke rocket at it and then try to find a fighter to take it out. Um, it carried 14 rockets and 2,000 rounds of ammunition for the four machine guns we had. Uh, <clears throat> but the most important thing I think we had in the airplane was five radios. Uh, I could talk to anybody. Um, we never tried it, but I could have called the states. Um, it, it, uh, we, we could talk to the Navy battleships. I could talk to Saigon. I could talk to 7th Air Force in the Philippines. You know, I could, communications was, in that airplane was amazing. Um, as, a, as a second lieutenant during a search and rescue mission, 
um, I sent a three-star general back home to his base with his ordinance and not allowing him to drop uh, because I was not happy with his participation uh, in you know I, can, I put a mark down I said you know I, I want a bomb on that mark and he wasn't within 500 yards of that so I just said take your airplane and your ordinance and go home um, and I didn't get any repercussions from that at all um, which was a good thing um, the mor morning of a April 2nd 1972 Gene Hamilton climbed into the co-pilot seat of an aircraft called an EB-66 which looks just like that and it is an unarmed airplane all it has is electronics and a lot of them and their mission was to go out and and um, try to mess with the surface to air missile systems that the North Vietnamese had in an effort to keep them from hitting B-52s and other airplanes um, it was dangerous mission um, and uh, when they got up to 30, they got up to 30,000 feet. Uh, Gene's aircraft was hit by a SA-2 missile, and uh, the captain of the airplane said, "Everybody bail out!" As the second one hit, and Gene was the only one to get out of the airplane. All the other, all other six crew members perished. Um, he was seen floating down in his parachute by a fact but the weather was was not good and he disappeared in the clouds uh, in the, as he was coming down so his actual location in the beginning w was not known um, he hit the ground and found a hole near a bushy knoll camouflaged it the best he could and climbed in uh, to hide and he was unaware that this would be his home for the next seven days an army helicopter team from the 8th Cavalry was nearby consisting of two helicopters uh, one was a Huey Slick called call sign was Blue Ghost 39 and one Cobra gunship call sign Blue Ghost 328 uh, they were hoping to go in real quick pick him up before the bad guys were aware of what was going on uh, the lead Huey was flying at about 50 feet above the ground at high speed and the Cobra was behind him at 3,000 feet altitude uh, and this was the proper position to cover a Huey during an ingress like that and as the Huey crossed the Camlo River um, and turned west suddenly they came under a very heavy fire Okay, this is this is the Camelot River, and this is where Gene was hiding. Gene was up in this area hiding, and um, <clears throat> the gunships came across down here, crossed the river, and and they they both got shot up real bad right there. Uh, the lead uh, Huey crashed. Um, crash landed and uh, came under direct attack from the North Vietnamese regulars on the ground there uh, and then uh, the aircraft exploded and and killed three of the crew members uh, the door gunners whose name was Jose Astorga was wounded and taken prisoner he was later released from the POW camp at the war's conclusion the Cobra gunship Blue Ghost 28 was severely damaged but managed to limp link limp bleh, limp and you can't see it here but the ocean is just off the this this river flows this way down to the ocean which is over here and and that's where um, that's where the, the the Cobra gunship went um, he managed to limp to the east and landed on the coastal beach and was picked up by a chopper from Da Nang and bad weather 
stopped any further attempts that day. At, not, at dawn the next day, a fact from NKP, in my squadron, uh, Nail 38, member of the three, <laughs> Nail 38, Bill Henderson uh, was flying as the pilot and Mark Clark was in the back seat. Uh, they arrived as the on-scene commander and shortly after they arrived, they were hit by a SAM missile and uh, Henderson jumped out and landed on the north side of the river and uh, his backseater, Mark Clark, landed on the south side and found a place to hide, but Henderson was captured right away. So, <clears throat> and then early on in the morning of April 6th, Bill Barron and I uh, went to our headquarters to be briefed on the SAR mission where I would be the next on-scene commander. Bill Barron was my backseater, and as I read the teletype, which was all the information about the rescue, you know, who he was and where he was and, and all, all that Intel knew. Um, I, I read this and I couldn't believe it. I stopped and I read it again. I said, Bill, you got to read this. Tell me if you get the same message I do. And what it said was, use all available action, assets, use all available assets to get him out. He must not fall into enemy hands. And I looked at Bill and I said, so we either get him out or we take him out. I said, that's right. That was our mission. So <clears throat> about a 45 minute flight from my home base to the area where uh, Gene, uh, Bat 21, was hiding. As, as I took off, I could hear a lot of chatter on the radios from the SAR and, you know, other people were, uh, were working the SAR and um, there was a on-scene commander at that time was flying an A1E Sky Raider. One of those. And um, he had two wingmen with him and they were um, vectoring in an H-53 helicopter uh, to pick up Gene. And I was still probably 20 minutes south. Um, I, I just, I wasn't there yet. Uh, and as they were bringing the helicopter in, um, you know, I, I said, you know, I hope, because I knew the area was really hot because of what, what had been going on, and, and as soon as this chopper crossed Camelo River, the gunfire became extremely intense and this huge chopper with six people on board um, crashed uh, in a huge ball of fire and no survivors. Uh, it burned for hours with a flickering orange flame and thick black smoke. The on-scene commander at that time was Sandy Zero One, and then he departed with his two wingmen, and I was left with a smoking mess, and Gene Hamilton and Mark Clark were still on the ground and both very unhappy. I called Gene on his survival radio because I knew he would be going crazy at the loss of six more men, uh, and another t failed attempt to get, and he was quite upset and talked about giving up. But I gave him a stern lecture. It, it was all G-rated. But, but, but I talked about people that had lost their lives to, in, to try to save him. And, uh, and after the talk, Gene decided he would not surrender. Um, the area was so hot that everyone seemed to be taking battle damage and I couldn't see any way that we could get another chopper in to get Gene or Mark uh, under the current situation. Um, the confirmed death toll uh, or captured at this time is 15. Between Gene's position and the ocean was a, a winding dirt road uh, just to the north side of the river and let's see if I can show where that is, yeah, okay. The, the road is right here And it's a, it's a dirt road, and I could see dust rising from there. So um, under closer examination, I could see five T-54 Russian tanks were traveling west along that river. 
um, I called for air support and I got four Marine A4s from the aircraft carrier. Uh, and they were carrying uh, Mark 82 500 pounders and uh, Zuni rockets. Um, and, and they're up at, you know, 25, 30,000 feet. And uh, so I, I shot a smoke rocket at the first tank and at the last tank. And they saw the smoke and then they came down to lower altitude and saw the tanks. And I turned them loose and, uh, you know, in just a few minutes, uh, all the smoke and everything was gone and they were all the tanks were destroyed uh, so the the pilots from the carrier were very happy and uh, off they went and then my aloof low fuel light came on so I had to go I didn't have enough fuel to get back to NKP so I went to Da Nang for fuel and rockets and some sleep uh, the next morning April 7th an OV-10 from Da Nang, whose call sign was Covey, was shot down while working as the on-scene commander, and both pilots e ejected and evaded capture for 11 days until it was rumored that they'd been captured, but neither one of these men were ever heard from again. Now with the death toll reaching 17, 7th Air Force decided that no aircraft would be sent to the rescue attempt. It was simply too dangerous. So we had to find another way to get Gene out. So we decided to move Gene to the Camelo River and hope we, we can get uh, a SEAL team in there to get him. Uh, but moving Gene was very difficult because the bad guys were listening to everything we said on the radio. So we couldn't say, Gene, head for the river. You know, we could not do that because the bad guys would grab him in an instant. So we had to figure another way because, and another problem we had was we had dropped um, small anti-personnel mines on, in certain places around him to keep the bad guys away from him. Well, that's the way we wanted to move him. So we had a problem. And, and so we talked to his squadron and I talked to some of his close friends and they said, he's a really good golfer and he has a photographic memory. And then the light went on. I said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna talk to him about golf courses that we f know from his friends he's played. And then we'll get the aerials of those golf courses and we'll pick out one of the holes that goes the right direction and is the right length. And so that's what we did. And we found that, got that information and the next day. I called him on his, on his survival radio and I said, Gene, I want you to play the sixth hole at Tucson International. And he said, what? <laughs> and I said, just think about it, Gene. And about three or four minutes later, he said, okay, I got it. And about 45 minutes later, he called me and said, I'm on the green. So we knew it would work and we worked him to the river using that tactic. And uh, you know, it, it, it worked really well. Um, yeah, he didn't understand that code at first, but it was, uh, I, I know it just made him go crazy. Uh, we, we, we only moved him at night because of the you know, obvious reasons. And if you saw the movie, it's, it's filmed someplace in California. The terrain is all wrong in the movie. Um, it's, it, it was mostly rice paddies and, and little shacks. And no mountains, no hills, just flat as a table. So that's another problem that was not right in the movie. Uh, we got him on the way to the river. And then we had to get the SEAL team who was going to get him. So this is the SEAL team. This is Tommy Norris. Um, you can probably guess which one he is. And the other one is uh, Nguyen Van Kett. And uh, these two guys were given the, the job. Now remember, there's 30,000 North Vietnamese all around there. 
And we were, gave them the, the job to get him off the side of the river. Um, so the two of them went down at night, it dressed themselves like the North Vietnamese, and they stole a sampan and they paddled up the river. And, and they went all the way up past the bridge and um, they didn't find him and the sun was starting to come up and so they turned around and it, it, Tommy Norris is blonde and blue eyed and it just doesn't fit in. <laughs> and, and so he was in a hurry to get you know, out of there and both of them were. So they get back in, in a friendly territory which was close to the ocean and then the next day they went out again and the next day they went farther yet and uh, and they found him and they put him in the boat and covered him with leaves and twice we had to go in uh, with OV-10s with our guns blazing to uh, stop the bad guys from from killing them. Uh, Nguyen said he saw a, a Vietnamese patrol right on the river bank and the river is not real wide and he said uh, this patrol was walking down the riverbank and uh, started yelling at them uh, to stop. And, and Nguyen said, we just kept slowly paddling downstream, never, never changed anything. And uh, Nguyen said, my back was just burning because I knew they were just going to open up on us and, and kill us. But it didn't happen. So um, here is an email I received like two weeks ago from Nguyen Van Kett. Um, <clears throat> he and I became good friends because we've uh, spoke in, in Nellis and some other places. Um, I tried to get him here tonight but he couldn't make it. Um, it says, hi John, I couldn't believe that mission have costed, and this is exactly the way it came through, have costed many lives for Sar to try taking Hamilton out. About the night Tom and I went up the river, I still really don't know anything about Hamilton being distressed. However, I worked side by side with my advisor Tom for the rest of that mission to bring Hamilton out safe. Uh, <clears throat> indeed, uh, Tom and I have a big commitment and trust each other to do this job. I did pray very hard on that night when the search was going on. I remember all night long that we traveled up to the Camelot River. Our paddles never stopped to reach to nowhere, but it was cold and fog surrounded us, only the enemies. Finally, we got Hamilton from the bad situation. Thank God for the SAR work together with the Special Operations Group to this impossible mission. And, and then he says, God bless you, our America. Nguyen Van Kett. Near the Camlo River, where it goes into the South China Sea, Gene was now in friendly territory. He had been extracted from the sampan and was placed in a stretcher. Uh, and Gene's physical condition was not good. Uh, he'd been hiding for 11 days with litter, little or no food and had a crushed vertebrae in his back from the ejection seat, broken arm, knife wounds from an encounter with a local, and severe dehydration. Uh, Tommy Norris, who's on the left, Tommy Norris received the Congressional Medal of Honor and Nguyen Van Kett received the Navy Cross, which is the highest medal ever given to a South Vietnamese. Uh, after the war ended and I returned to the States, I was invited to San Antonio, Texas to speak along with Tom and Nguyen about this rescue, which was the first time that I had met both these men in person. Uh, Fifteen years after the BAT-21 rescue, I was invited by the Air Force to attend a symposium at Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas. I was asked to speak about the rescue and several of the participants were there along with Gene Hamilton. Um, let me see if I can get out of here. Uh, 
this isn't the greatest picture. But anyway, this was at Nellis. And uh, <coughs> Daryl Whitcomb that wrote the book about this rescue, uh, he's the half a guy on the left side. <laughs> and, and beside him is Bat 21, Gene Hamilton. And I don't know why my eyes are closed. I think I'm having a nap there. <laughs> And then the guy behind him is uh, um, <clears throat> was my backseater, Rick Atchison, was an excellent, excellent backseater. And then that's Nguyen Van Ket. Um, Tommy Norris could not make it. Um, he, he goes from surgery to surgery because he had some severe uh, damage, lost an eye and all that, so he couldn't make it. Um, and I had never met uh, Gene Hamilton in person. Uh, so I, when I walked up on stage at Nellis, I, I said, hi, Gene, and put my hand out. And he shook my hand. And he, he, I said, hi, Gene. I said, I'm John Van Etten. And I shook his hand. And he said, no. He said, you're nail 32. I'd recognize that voice anywhere. <laughs> so. That's basically it. Is there any questions? Just before we uh, take questions here, um, I do have one thing for you from uh, here from EAA, as is tradition at these uh, at these speaker series. We had a uh, little plaque made up. It says EAA presented to John Van Etten in recognition of supporting the EAA mission and programs. We proudly thank you. And it's signed by our president and chairman, Jack Pelton. Wow. Well, thank, and, thank you very much. And on behalf of all of us, John, thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, what, what questions do we have? Yes, sir. Uh, that I don't know, um, but the whole thing was for us to get him out, you know, just make sure he did not fall in their hands because they would have shipped him to Russia in 30 seconds and he, we'd never see him again. It would be not good. So. I'm sorry? Uh, about, about 15, um, you know, some were successful and, and some were real easy and some were like my roommate, um, i tell you another story, um, his call sign was nail 31 and, and we were both sent to the same, <clears throat> let me go back a step, the airplane that we flew, the OB-10 had a laser system on it that could accurately guide lay smart bombs and believe it or not this isn't you know 71 so um, you know the Air Force has some pretty cool technology but we were both sent to a target uh, we called the catcher's mitt because the the river made the shape of a catcher's mitt and that was the target um, and they were sending laser guided bombs from the aircraft carrier you know, to hit this truck park or whatever. I forget exactly what the mission was. So anyway, um, we, we, have, we can't test the laser until you're above 4,000 feet because it's too strong in friendly territory. People look, up and get, look at it and get blinded. So um, we went up to 4,000 feet. We unstowed, turned on the laser pod, and Dave's worked, but mine wouldn't. I couldn't get it to fire. So I said, Dave, I'm going to go back and get another airplane. You go ahead. The bombs are on the way. So you go ahead and, you know, out to the catcher's mitt. So he goes out. I go back down, jump out of that airplane, jump in another one, and take off. And by the time I'm 4,000 feet, I'm just unstowing the pod. Um, I can hear on the radio that he's been shot down. So, um, you know, we worked, you know, I worked all that day. Um, I, I took all those bombs, and, and instead of going after a truck park, I tried to cut all the roads, because the bombs were 2,000 pound Mark 84s. 
and they do a really good job on blowing up roads. And I didn't want them driving trucks in there with, you know, troops and start looking for these guys. So um, I, I blew up the roads, and then, uh, and then the next on-scene commander uh, came in an A1E Sky Raider, a uh, little H model that, that has a canopy that's really tiny. And, you know, the first thing that you do when the new on-scene commander comes there is you have to tell him the situation, and then you have to show him where the survivors are. And you can't do that by shooting a rocket, you know, tell everybody where he is. So um, what I was doing, I got up right on his wing and about four feet away from him, and I'm talking to him about the river. And I said, you know, I see that little brown tree there, and, you know, well, he's, you know, I was talking to him uh, from ground references and then over to where Dave was hiding. Uh, so he would know after I left where not to drop bombs and stuff. So as I'm talking to him about that, he gets hit in the engine with a 37 millimeter. And it just, the engine just goes, just explodes. And then it's, but it's still running. <clears throat> and, and then the smoke trail is, you know, like you see at Oshkosh. You know, like, I mean, it's just white smoke coming out of the back of the engine. And he's panicked because we're like 2,000 feet. And the oil has come out of the engine and just completely covered the canopy. So he can't see anything out the, out the wind outside. And all his instruments are shot. The attitude indicator, nothing's working. And so he said, I'm, I'm jumping out, I'm bailing. I said, don't do it. You know, all I need is three guys on the ground here. So, um, you know, I finally calmed him down and I vectored him. I just said, turn right, now stop your turn, turn left. And, and I got him out of the area, uh, out into the uh, rice paddies. Um, and I got an Air America, I saw somebody with an Air America shirt. I got an Air America chopper on the, on the radio coming, and uh, uh, that chopper got there almost the same time he landed in the rice paddy. And he bailed out and landed in the rice paddy. Air America picked him up, and he was gone. Uh, and by this time, I am, like, out of fuel. Um, so I headed back home, and I didn't think I was going to make it. But uh, I, in the flare, both engines stopped. So. I had to get a truck to pull me off the runway, but I made it back anyway. And I called Dave, you know, that as I was leaving, um, I called him. I said, Dave, how, you know, tell me, we had a list that we, we asked questions. You know, how many bottles of water do you have? How many batteries for your radio? We had a whole list of things. And so he's reading that list off to me. And he said, and I've got an AK-47. I said, Dave, what? He said, I've got an AK-47. I said, where the hell did you get that? He said, from the Gomer that I just shot. <laughs> I mean, I did a lot of rescues over there, and not one of them, the survivor shot his way out with his 38 caliber pistol and made it. But Dave did. We got him out the next morning. But Spectre came in. We had, they had, we had Spectre come in, which is a C-130 gunship. And they came in that night with all the, they have all, all this low light night stuff. And uh, they killed the 37 millimeter and cleaned the area. And when they picked up Dave at like 8.30 in the morning, they, they didn't, not one shot was fired. They, they, Dave, Dave said it was perfectly quiet. So anyway, we got him. Any other questions? Yes, sir. How many different ats assets were involved with, with the rescue? Oh, sorry. How many, how many facts were involved with the rescue of Bat-2-1? Well, they, they, they tried to always have an on-scene commander around the clock. Um, and they tried to do that, but a lot of times it didn't. Either weather stopped it, you know, or one shows up and they shoot it down. And, you know, they, they tried to keep somebody there all the time, but, you know, it, it was hit and miss. Any other questions? Yes, sir. What became of Mr. Hamilton? 
Mr. Hamilton, um, and, and that's 15 years after the rescue. Oh, that's the wrong picture. Um, yeah. Um, there he is behind me um, 15 years after the rescue. So he, he get, came back really well and uh, played a lot of golf. <laughs> Other questions? Okay. Is there any other questions? Yes, sir. Did you continue flying after you left the Air Force? Um, at the, I was, my job after the war, uh, my, my orders were as a flight instructor, but to be a flight instructor, you have to go to flight instructor school. And there was so many pilots coming out of Southeast Asia at that time that there was a six month waiting list to get to that school. And so, the base commander where, where I was supposed to teach said, where do you live? I said, Indiana. He said, go home. He said, I'll, I'll call you, you know, every, every few weeks and tell you how your slot's coming. And so I went back to Indiana, and I was having a great time going to football games and having a great time. And, uh, and then I, I met this a retired general from the Army, and he said, you really need to go down to to Terre Haute and talk to the guard unit down there. They, they're in, in dire needs of somebody that knows how to drop a bomb accurately. <laughs> so I said, well, okay, I'll go talk to him. So I did and, uh, you know, I was hired within a week and out of the regulars and into the guard. And I spent eight years with the guard. Um, and it was, it was fun. I mean, there was some mistakes I made. I, I'll never fly a single engine single seat fighter from Indiana to England again. <laughs> no autopilot. You know, you, you have like six layers of clothing. You know, you got all this poopy suit and all this flight suit and all this stuff. And you're flying behind the tanker because, you know, he knows where England is. You don't. <laughs> and. And my wingman is flying, fly and, and he starts doing this, you know. And I said, well, have you found it yet? <laughs> He's digging through the layers. <laughs> That's a long trip. <laughs> I'll tell you another story about like that. I was coming back in the OB-10 with a back seater, and uh, we'd been at... 12,000 feet because they were just shooting the heck out of us and um, and it was uh, cold believe it or not at that altitude and in other words we're coming back into into uh, NKP and and I you know it's five and a half hour mission some of them and uh, it, it was time I had to relieve myself so I get out the little relief tube and uh, I, I start doing my thing, and all of a sudden I hear on the intercom, stop! <laughs> and I looked in the rearview mirror, and the back seater had his little, you know, pee cup. And he's holding it as high as he can, and the pee's running down his arm. I said, I think we got a malfunction here. John told me that story earlier today, and uh, as, as he was starting, I was just kind of scanning the audience, making sure we didn't have any kids here. I think we're good. So. <laughs> I'm sorry? Uh, you know, I don't remember. <laughs> One more? F-100s, and then the F-4, and then the F-16. So, whatever the guard had, I flew it. Yeah, I started with the F-100, and then uh, they went to the F-4, and then they went to the F-16. What kind of progression is it? I mean, you, you, so in eight years, you went from an F-100 to an F-16. What, what was that like? That, that's a huge leap in, in uh, even just flight controls technology. Um, it really was uh, easier than, than you might think. I mean, uh, the F-100 had all kinds of nasty flight characteristics. I mean, in the traffic pattern flying an uh, F-100, you just leave the stick alone. 
and, and when you want to turn, you just push the rudder. Because in a swept wing airplane, the rudder is a roll control. So, um, and if you didn't, if you just, if you took the stick and turned the, pushed the stick to the left, the airplane would shake and go to the right. So, it, it had some really nasty flight characteristics. But the F-4 was, it was a, you know, I flew it off the carrier with the Navy, and uh, um, it, it was a, it had its problems too. The best thing it did was burn fuel. Does that very well, yeah. Oh man, does it ever, yeah. So. Thanks. Well, I was our squadron Navy liaison officer. So one of my duties was to go out and fly off the carrier, and they took one of their guys and, and put, it, put them in our squadron. And so we traded. Um, and and that, was a, that was a trip, I'll tell you. Um, you know, I'd never done the, of course, I wasn't flying. I was in the, either the back, back seat or on the A6, it was in the right seat. Uh, but um, there's no, no ride in the carnival like, that, like the catapult. <laughs> It, it will get your attention. And we pulled on the catapult. They, they taxi onto the catapult uh, for launch. And they hook, and we're loaded. We've got, I don't know how many, Mark 82s, and we got sparrows, and we got sidewinders, and we're loaded. And we pull on the, the catapult, and the master caution light flashes. And it's a big red warning light right in your front, like right in front of you. And I, I, what's that, you know? And, and he said, oh, it's a fuel low light. <laughs> I said, we're not even in the air yet, and we're low on fuel? He said, we have seven minutes of gas. I said, let me get this right. <laughs> seven minutes. He said, yeah, if you look up, you can see the tanker, uh, the A6 tanker orbiting above the carry. He said, we'll take off, put the gear up, plug into the tanker, take on fuel, go to the target, come off the target, hit another tanker, and orbit till the, air, till the carrier is in landing configuration, and, and, and then, then we land. You know, <laughs> you know, man, this is like starting every mission with an emergency. I mean, really. Yes, sir. Is it true that Navy pilots are the best in the world for landing? <laughs> Oh, please. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't vote that way, let's put it that way. I mean, you don't land an airplane on a carrier. You, you fly an airspeed, an angle of attack, and aim for a point. And as soon as you decide the airplane is going to impact the, air, the carrier, you go to full afterburn. Because if you miss the cables, you don't want to be sitting back there with low power because you'll just go over the end of the deck. Because that, they, those jets take so long to accelerate that uh, you, know, you have to get the power up there. So when you catch the cable, not only does it have to stop the airplane, but it has to stop the airplane at full power. So it's a pretty amazing system. I, I just, I've, I've watched videos of uh, people taking cat shots and what always strikes me is, um, you know, you're, you're looking in the cockpit fit footage and you see everybody else on the ship is running away from the machine that you're strapped into. Uh, that's got to be a great feeling. <laughs> yeah. I, <clears throat> and we pull on the, onto, the car onto the catapult and, and they're hooking us up and the guy's standing there with a the chalkboard. And he holds this chalkboard up to us and it says 38,000 plus four. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, the 38,000 is what the catapult is set to f for our weight to, to, you know, to launch us. And I said, what's the plus four? He said, that's knots above stall at the end of the deck. <laughs> and I'm like, how did I get into this? <laughs> And that's why when you see it come off the carrier, they tend to do this, because they are right at the ragged edge of a stall. Tim? Yes, sir. Do you have a favorite plane you like to fly? My world's favorite airplane is the T-38. I love that airplane. Uh, you know, I thought I would have the same feelings for the F-16, but I don't. Um, 
It doesn't fly like an airplane. Um, it, I mean, it really doesn't. It, you, <clears throat> you take off in a regular airplane uh, and, and um, you know, get it to cruise and let go of it, and it'll, you know, start to descend or it'll start to do something else. The F-16 won't. It just sits there. And if you pull a nose up 10 degrees and let go of it, it just stays there. Um, we were coming back from, and another thing that worries me about the, that airplane is it has a really excellent radar. Um, we, were, we were at Columbus, Indiana. R-3401 was the gunnery range that we were at. And we were coming back from the range, Atterbury gunnery range. And we were coming back to Terre Haute. And uh, uh, I'm flying a thing at 4,000 feet, uh, VFR westbound you know, cruising at like 400 knots. And, you know, we're just buzzing along and air traffic control call, and, and I'm looking at the radar and I can see airplanes taking off and landing at O'Hare. I mean, we're at 4,000 feet clear down in, in, you know, southern Indiana. And uh, I'm thinking, that is amazing. And, so, and then air traffic control calls me and says, um, you've got traffic, 12 o'clock, 4,000 feet, uh, nose to nose with us. So I'm looking at the radar, there's nothing there. I said, this isn't right. And so, you know, I, and ATC is, because of our speed, you know, they're getting antsy. And they said, you know, 12 o'clock, 10 miles, eight, seven, six. And so I just pulled the nose up and rolled upside down. And this little 172 goes putt, 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 you know. <laughs> Under, underneath us, never saw it on, the, on that radar. So I get back and I get a hold of the radar guy that does the maintenance on the radars. I said, tell me why, you know, I can see the airplanes at O'Hare, but I can't see somebody right in front of me. He said, what's in the software? I said, what? He said, in the F-16, they have, they have set the software so if any target is going less than 200 knots, they throw it out. And so, you know, 172s, you know, F-16 can't see you. Or balloons, or anything else. It's crazy, I don't, you know, he said, then I said, well, why would they do something like that? He said, because if, if they let the radar paint everything that's, you know, moving, basically, he said it would be completely covered. And he said, and then all your, it would show all the trucks on the interstate, it would show everything. So they, they have to start limiting what it, what it shows. We're going to have to find that uh, 172 driver and let him know he's uh, one of the only people that ever survived to the merge with an F-16. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyone else? All right, well, once again, John, thank you so much. Um, oh, you're you know, I, I, you're... <laughs> Thank you very much. I would just say that your story is, uh, your, your many stories are testament to, um, to our commitment to not leave anyone behind, and you're a, a, a yeah. shining example of that. Thank you. Yeah.